Hello and welcome everyone to the webinar Potential and Suitability, Measuring Intelligence Intelligently. My name is Nicholas Klant and I'm a consultant at Shufried who has attended our webinars before knows that they are split into two parts. We will start with a presentation providing information about the Adaptive Intelligence Structure Battery 2, short INSPA 2, followed by an interactive part where you can ask questions and we will try to answer them. If you want to ask a question, you can either use the hand sign, which you find in your GoToWebinar interface, or write it to us with the chat function. I'm very pleased to not be by myself today, as Nicole Prohaska, a colleague of mine, is joining me later and will help me answer the questions questions that you might have. In today's job market, it is increasingly difficult to find suitable personnel. Everyone knows the famous shortage of skilled workers. People change their employer, employee more and more often or completely reorient themselves in order to enter new industries. In addition, the requirements of modern workplaces are changing rapidly with the constant digitalization, automation and globalization of today. What was learned at great cost yesterday may no longer be relevant today. In the case of universities, you often have to deal with applicants who have little to no work experience and have not yet been able to prove themselves. This makes it even more important to assess the potential of applicants. With people that have little to no work experience, you might ask yourself, does my applicant or client have the potential for a particular profession? The changing requirements of jobs might lead you to ask, can my applicant or client adapt to new requirements of the set jobs? And with applicants or clients that switch the industry entirely, you might ask, does my applicant or client have the potential to be successful in this industry? At Shufried, we give you the INSPA2. It is a comprehensive package to answer all these questions. How do we do that? The INSPA2 measures cognitive ability. And professional and academic success is significantly influenced by general cognitive ability. Cognitive abilities in general are often referred to as intelligence. Measures of cognitive ability are related to a wide range of different performance criteria. And finally, cognitive abilities have abilities have high predictive power for school, academic and professional success. INSPA2 rests upon a broad scientific basis. It is based on the kettlehorn Carell model of intelligence, uh, which I will shortly describe now. Many of you might know it already. The model postulates a general factor of intelligence and divides intelligence into subsections. Five of these subsections, also called secondary factors, are measured by INSPA2. You might ask yourself, how did we choose these subsections? And the answer is pretty simple. We choose the ones that are most predictive for career and academic success. For example, we have fluid intelligence, which has multiple tests for logical reasoning, or crystallized intelligence, intelligence, which is acquired knowledge and text comprehension, as an example. Furthermore, we have quantitative thinking, which is mostly maths, and then visual sp spatial processing and long-term memory. A variety of subtests allows flexibility, flexibility and adaptation to your needs. Um, four of the five uh, secondary factors have multiple subtests. The only secondary factor that only has one subtest is long-term memory. I will introduce some of these subtests. Here we have text comprehension. And text comprehension is what it says, pretty easy. You have a text that you have to read and then you have to answer uh, questions regarding the text and we test if you understood what is said in the text. Another one that you might know is figural inductive reasoning and you might know it from classics such as the AMT, it's a matrix test and you have nine squares and one of the squares is a question mark and you have to figure out which of the squares on the right fits into the um, square on the left following the rules of the other squares. We also have visualization which is uh, a completely new task and it asks the question 
which of the figures on the bottom of the screen could be combined from the figures above. So figures are cut into individual parts and must be combined in your mind to picture the whole figure and together with mental rotation, the secondary factor visual, visual processing can be calculated from, from these two tasks. Current norms from the Schufried Research Center in Vienna provide a good basis for comparison. Uh, we have a very big norm sample that contains 714 people. It is representative for Austria, Germany and Switzerland, but for the age range of 14 to 70 years and was collected in 2019. All the test persons have performed all subtests, so it's an overall norm. It's not hacked to together from individual samples. And the languages that are available are German and English, which makes the InSpot suitable for international use. We also have a large quantity of items, and that reduces the possibility for cheating. InSpot 2 uses automatic item generation. Here you have uh, kind of an example. The dark uh, blue dots are harder items, more difficult items. The light blue dots are the easier items. And with this automatic item generation, we have a big number of items. So around 100 to over 300 items per subtests. And with only a small number of items from the InSpot 1. And all the new items are exclusive for InSpot 2, obviously. And furthermore, we have a completely separate item pool for the screening form. We have a screening form that you can administer, administer online openly and that has a completely separate item pool. And this guarantees a very high test safety. And this high number of items is also pretty impressive because we use adaptive testing. And it's harder to construct items for adaptive testing in general. And so adaptive testing enables also precise testing at all performance levels. And um, some of you might know what adaptive testing is. Some of you don't. So I will just explain it shortly. We again have, have this big item pool. And um, here's a test person. And the darker blue representing, again, a higher difficulty. And because the test person correctly answers the first question, the difficulty gets harder. So you see, uh, first on uh, the first dot, it answers the question correctly, it gets harder, answers correctly, gets harder again. And then um, the, answer, the answer is incorrect and it gets a bit slightly lower, so it's a bit easier again, and that ramps up again. And with a second person, you can see quite the opposite. The person answers mostly incorrectly, and so the difficulty uh, drops and it gets easier over time. So the tasks that you see are different every time, and they depend on the response behavior. And you also have a variable number of task, tasks, and you can still obviously compare these two, two persons, even though they saw different tasks. And because we have these adaptive items and this big adaptive item pool, we can also do something new. We have randomized testing, which makes for a modern way of linear testing. Linear testing, you all probably know. You have a very small item pool, and then all the people get the same items. And the items are always uh, the same. They're independent of response behavior. There's a fixed number of tasks and the item difficulty is extending. And so randomized linear testing is something completely new. It's done with adaptive. So we have the adaptive item pool, the very big one. And then you can see it looks quite the same. It's also ascending item difficulty, fixed number of tasks and independent of response behavior. But what you can see if you look closely is that person one gets first the item three, person two gets first the item two, person one then gets item seven, then 23, test person two gets item 11, item 18. So they both get different items, but with the same general difficulty. And this is possible because our tests are adaptive. And you can compare the different persons again, even though they got different items. And especially in group settings, this is very helpful because person one can't look at the screen of person two to figure out what the answer might be because person two has a completely different task and a completely different item. And this leads again to more test safety. 
The INSPAR 2 has a modern design that is internationally applicable. And an example would be the long-term memory. Here you can see uh, INSPAR 1 and here INSPAR 2. And we have a diverse cast of people, more diverse cast of people, so it's more representative of the globalized world. And furthermore, you can see that it closer looks, uh, looks a bit more like reality, like a real CV, which also helps the test. And then we have more design, modern test designs as well. One example would be mental rotation. You can see the conventional test design, uh, which is cubes with different patterns on their sides. You probably all know this design and you have to figure out if you can rotate one of the cubes to look like the one on the left. And uh, this has been around for well over 40 years and we reworked it and now it looks like this. It measures the same thing, but it's completely new and uh, you have a figure and you have to figure out how to rotate this figure in the start view to look like the finish view on the bottom right. And this also adds to test safety since for the conventional design there's a lot of item material available on the web and you can tra quite, train it quite easily and with these new figures that's very hard to do. Wherever online screening or on-site high-stakes testing INSPAR2 delivers, we have different kind of delivery modes. We have online screening, which is resource efficient testing of many applicants, and it gives you maximum flexibility through decentralized testing. And the applicants can themselves start the test whenever they like. They are also not bound by time zones. So this is very good if you want to test a lot of people, if you give them the maximum flexibility, if you want to do a screening and later on take the people um, for in-depth review that uh, were better and that you liked more, where the test results fit your criteria, criteria better. Then we have proctored mode, which also gives you a great cover coverage through decentralized testing again, but it gives you the test safety through su supervision via a webcam. So um, it guarantees test safety because you can watch the people do the tests, but you still have this great coverage, which is especially good in recent times uh, where traveling might be not an option. And then last but not least, of course, we have on-site testing, which gives you maximum test safety for high stakes testing. And it also makes possible the direct interactions with applicants or clients, which might be especially good in counseling settings or if you have uh, young clients or applicants. Regarding test selection, Shufri provides ideas and you can customize. So here you can see the standard form S1 that has extended options and there's the default templates that we um, provide. One is for non-technical application areas, one for technical application areas, and then we have a short form and a long form. Furthermore, we have the screening form S2, which has three subtests, figural inductive reasoning, verbal fluency, and mathematical flexibility and it has its own item pool and it can be sent out openly over the web. And um, yeah, these are these two forms.